Let's start the uh, session in the afternoon. Uh, I'm going to continue basically with Marielle uh, finished yesterday, but we are going to shift gears a little bit and talk about more about random processes that occur in the process of, uh, of nothing. So first of all, I've been doing my homework and Radmila asked us to look for nuts in town and I f we found some nuts last night in town. So keep working on them. <laughs> I'm sure there is more. All right, so uh, I'm going to be, I, I changed a little bit uh, uh, the, what I'm going to say of from what I, I, I sent in the, in the program. I'm going to try to uh, condense here a couple of topics. One is DNA packing in, in these viruses and the other one is DNA packing in trypanosomes. And tomorrow I'll talk about uh, uh, different, uh, different things. Initially I had proposed to spend one full day in this topic and another, full, another day on this, but uh, I think we can, uh, w we can combine these two in one single, one single unit. All right, so what you see here was uh, uh, a picture, an electron micrograph taken by uh, one of our students, Tamara, that you saw, saw her yesterday in the lab, in the lab uh, picture. And these are viruses, and I'm going to be talking about this type of viruses um, uh, today, and how the DNA is packed in these viruses, and what random nothing can tell us about these uh, these processes. But before we get there, let me tell you kind of a motivation for studying random processes in nothing and DNA. Um, let's see if this works, this doesn't work. All right, so in the 90s, uh, even though some of the theory had been done earlier, uh, biologists were interested in taking a piece of DNA and making it cyclic in solution. And two papers came out uh, the same year, 93. And the reason why biologists were interested was on one hand trying to understand the uh, equilibrium values of, uh, or the distribution of topologies uh, when you have circular molecules in equilibrium. And the other one was to uh, measure the probability that a molecule in solution when it closes, it will form a knot, and then how that knotting is gonna change when you change soil conditions. As Mariel uh, mentioned yesterday, DNA is a negatively charged molecule, so it will tend to repel itself. However, if you put positive ions, then that shielding kind of disappears, so the, the effective diameter becomes uh, less and less, and the knotting probability in principle is going to increase, so it's gonna make, it's like making uh, a thinner molecule. So here what they did in both of these studies is they took DNA molecules and uh, they put them in different soil conditions and then they look at the knotting probability and the knot distribution. And based on that, they tried to infer how thick the DNA was. So I'm going to guide you on how we would do such experiment first and then how we would analyze it and then we'll move from there to, to bacteriophages and to panosomes. So how can we make a molecule uh, that is linear, circular? Well, in biology, it's very typical to have this type of what are called sticky ends. So as we mentioned yesterday, DNA is a linear molecule, a double-stranded DNA molecule. However, you can have ends that are single-stranded, as is shown in here, and the sequence is complementary to each other. So what is gonna happen is that C will look to pair with G and A with T and so on. So in that way, if you have a molecule that is floating in solution and it's the two ends uh, will come, will meet, and if they have this complementary sequence, then they will anneal with each other and it will stay there, All right? And this won't break unless you heat it up. And that's an experiment we did at some point, and I'll, I'll show it to you. All right. So you go from a this or a population of linear molecules to a population of circular molecules, and then you can ask what's the probability that you are going to get a knot out of that. Okay. Now, how do we are going to do this? Well, we need to first you need to produce these uh, these molecules, which is not very difficult, and the second step is to look at them under them uh, or identify them in the lab. 
Now, this is how biologists, oh, it's a little bit too clear, uh, biologists uh, identify knots in the lab. Uh, a couple of pictures, electron micrographs pictures were shown just today. However, that technique takes quite a long time and, and is very laborious. Uh, but there is a very simple technique to identify knots, and this is called gel electrophoresis. And it's based on this idea that uh, DNA is a negatively charged molecule. So how does it work? So you first make a bed, it's not shown, well, you, you have a, some sort of uh, a base, and here you are going to pour agarose. So you take uh, agarose, the sugar, and you, then you mix it with water, and you fix the percentage of agarose, and a higher percentage will make the gel thicker, a lower percentage will make the gel um, kind of softer. And then you wait for this agarose to become solid, and in the process, once you pour the melted agarose, what you do is you have to put a comb here. When the gel solidifies, then the, uh, the, these little legs of the comb, or the dents of the comb, will uh, kind of make these little holes in the agarose. So you can carefully remove it, and now you have an agarose gel in which you have, um, uh, in which you have these little holes. Now you are going, before you do this, you are going to put the agarose gel in a bath. Uh, basically, it's going to have, uh, it's going to be a medium that conducts ions uh, easily. And uh, you, what you are going to do before you connect it to electricity, so you don't get electrocuted, you take samples of DNA and you load them in these little holes. Then you, once you load the samples, then you close this you connect it to an electrical, uh, to the electricity, and then you create an electric field in here. Now, as I mentioned, DNA is a negatively charged molecule, and the negative charges stay on the backbone, on the outside of the, of the DNA. So if you put, if your samples are here, and you put a negative charge here, and a positive charge there, then the DNA molecules will start migrating from the negative charge to the positive charge. Now, because we have a gel, then you can think that it's kind of like a strain or like a mace. And the gel is going to have gel, they're going to have fibers, and then the DNA molecules are going to reptate through these fibers, okay? Going away from the negative molecule, uh, from the negative charge towards the positive charge. In this reptation process, uh, for our case, the knot complexity is going to be key to allow the molecules to go further. For instance, if I have a trefoil, a trefoil will, be, will have what is called a large radius of gyration, so it will be kind of floppy, and it will tend to, to get stuck in these pores or these, uh, uh, these holes that you have in the gel. Then, <coughs> excuse me, if you have a molecule that is more condensed, that is more compact, then the molecule will move easier through these holes and eventually will, trap over, will stop over there. So you, when you run this experiment, you don't see anything. You just, you, 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 you have a drop of liquid that presumably has your DNA. You put the, this drop of liquid here, you let it run, and when you are stopping these experiments, you still don't see anything. The only way to see anything is when you add ethidium bromide. Ethidium bromide is going to be uh, is a chemical that intercalates in the DNA helix, and then if you put that under UV light, then you can see these bands. Right? So you kind of go blind through the experiment, and it's only at the end when you when you uh, uh, kind of taint or paint the the gel is that you see these bands. Here is a we are going to have the the circle, the unknotted molecule. And then this will be a linear molecule, and then I have trefoils for crossing fives and so on and so forth, right? And we can actually differentiate between the 5.1 and 5.2. Uh, how good you can differentiate molecules depends on how much sugar you can put and how much voltage you put in this, in this gel. Any questions about this experimental method? Yes. Uh, a drug? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's gonna, that's gonna, due to the, due to the, to the gel fibers, if that's what you're asking. 
yeah, yeah, you you do that, you do that, but you still have you, you still have that that drug from the from the from the fibers. Yeah. Wait, well, yeah, it could break. You have when you when you process DNA, uh, sometimes it will break, or sometimes at the time when you extract these molecules from whatever experiment you are doing, some of those reactions didn't com were not complete. So then you have linear pieces. Yeah, it's kind of a contaminant. Yeah, they could. Versus, versus smaller, yeah. So the way you do the experiments, uh, the concatenation will happen usually only on the DNA, on the linear molecules. These ones, the way they are done are t is to make sure that at the end of the, of the reaction you have one molecule. I'm going to show you one, some cases in which it's not so much the complexity, but it's the number of molecules you that you have attached to them. That, that would be way over here. I, I'll show you some figures and you'll you'll be able to see how they migrate. No question. So the idea is that the more complicated ones will kind of make think on a sphere around these knots, and the sphere has to go through this maze, and then the smaller knots will go. Will you can compact them in a smaller sphere and it can go faster through these little holes. The because so take if you take a rope and then you start making more knots and then then the knot will come will kind of condense. Yeah, yeah, you are going to fix that. <laughs> Any other questions? All right. So this is how we look at knots uh, in the in the lab, and. This is the experiments that uh, they did in the Cosarelli lab in the 90s, in the paper that I showed you earlier. And what you see here, this is a knot ladder. So you use this with the site-specific recombinases that Marielle was talking about yesterday. So you know exactly what type of knots these are. And this is the one that you produce with a 10.5 kilobase DNA molecule. And what you see here is that you have mostly unknots and then trefoils, and then a tiny bit of four crossing knots. All right? So that's, again, a molecule of 10.5 uh, uh, kilobases in free solution with sticky ends. All right, so this is the quantification of the gel. So once you obtain these gels, then you can measure how much, uh, what's the signal in here, and then you get these different peaks. <coughs> All right, so then the question from a math point of view and not theory point of view is, can we develop mathematical models to answer these questions? First, why do we see knots? And second, why are the knots mostly trefoils? So let me introduce you some mathematical models that we use to study random, what we call random knotting, or process of knotting through randomness. All right, the first, uh, one of the first models that, or one of the most studied models uh, is the simple cubic lattice. Uh, in this model, you have the uh, the vertices of the walk in the in a lattice in which you have integer coordinates. So it would be x, y, c, and x, y, c will be integer coordinates, and the distance in between two points, uh, two vertices, is going to be one. So you don't allow either diagonal crosses, or you don't take this as a one single unit. So this would be two units. So this method. Uh, one of some of the good things that the mis this method have is that the, um, uh, it includes what is called volume exclusion. What I was saying earlier, DNA is a negatively charged molecule, so it has a volume inherent to it. So this model naturally incorporates that volume exclusion because you are just allowed through this to go through this lattice. And uh, there is a large body of theoretical work already. 
This has been uh, mainly done by the people that you see here, and some of you come from these labs. So Stu Whittington, and Sorlandini, uh, Tessie, sorry about the spelling, uh, Van Riesberg, Soteros, Sumners, Chan, Diao, Ernst, Shimokawa, and Ishihara. So um, there is uh, a lot of, uh, some of these people have basically looking for what are the properties of these molecules when they are large. They ask what's the noting probability of a molecule like this when the length of the molecule goes up to infinity. And you can do both simulations, which is one of the pros, the, the good things about this. You can do simulations and you can do also uh, analytical works. You can actually prove theorems. <coughs> the problem that this model has is that uh, you need to observe nothing and so on because of the structure of the, of the lattice. You usually need very long chains, so it takes longer to compute. And uh, when you talk to biologists, then they will tell you that this is not realistic. The reason being that DNA is not going to have these sharp turns, right? But qualitatively, it's going to tell you things that are actually applied to, to the DNA molecule. <coughs> so we'll talk about this tomorrow a little bit. Now, a model that we have studied uh, uh, in our group uh, together with the AO, as shown in here, is the, what is called the equilateral random polygon or freely joined chain. It depends if you talk to physicists or you talk to mathematicians. So physicists will use freely joined chain. So the idea here, now you are off lattice. This is an off lattice model. And the distance, again, between two points is constant. And the, basically, when you have two segments, two consecutive segments, you can rotate completely uh, freely. And that's what is called freely joined. There is no restriction on the angles that they can take. Uh, this is a good model for DNA uh, for large polygons, when the, poly or when the DNA is lar uh, a large molecule. By large, in this case, I mean about larger than 10.5 or, or about 10 uh, kilobases. It's computationally very fast, and I'll explain a couple of algorithms. And it allows you to prove some theorems. And the, the reason why you can prove theorems is because you know what is the probability that a vertex is at a given distance from the origin after k steps, right? So you are going to start your polygon and look, imagine that this is the origin, and then you have a measure on what's the probability that this vertex would be at a given position. So it's kind of a radial measure, uh, as is, and then the probability is going to follow this Gaussian distribution. So once you have once you know what's the distribution of vertices when you start from the origin, then you can start proving theorems. And this is kind of one of uh, Diao's, our collaborator, spe speciality. Now, the bad thing is that it's not so realistic for short chains, for short chains, and uh, it has no volume exclusion. So if you want to have volume exclusion, you have to add an extra parameter that says, or an extra condition in your programs that says if the conformation that I generate uh, or if I have two segments in the conformation that are short that are closer than whatever distance you want to put then you have to toss that conformation away so it really takes a longer time to compute all right so you have you're, you're going to generate these things at random and then you will have this rejection uh, criterion if two segments are closer than whatever whatever value you take to set up. So it makes, makes it good to go slower. Again, there is a uh, people, a uh, number of people who have work in this model or similar models. Uh, Diao is the, as far as I know, the only one together maybe with Millet that have been able to prove theorems uh, using this model um, and, and Klaus as well, Klaus Anders. Then the rest tend to be, uh, or the Rodan, Micheletti and Orlandini, they tend to do more simulations. And, al and design algorithms. All right, so this is the model that was proposed by physicists, uh, mainly Alexander Bologotsky, Klenin, and Frank Kamenetsky. Uh, this model comes back from the 80s, it's uh, early 80s or late 70s. Uh, it's being used a lot by a number of groups, and uh, lately Spakovich has proposed kind of a new, uh, a new model. Uh, which somehow is very similar to, to what's proposed here, but, uh, but it has kind of a, 
and adi additional details, I would say. Uh, so what is the idea of this model? Well, take the model that I described earlier, and now you're going to put a penalty on the bending. Now you don't let free rotation, but you're, you need, for any two consecutive segments, you have to, you're going to have a, a, a bending penalty. And then you're going to have also, well, the, de the length of the segment is going to become shorter and shorter. Right? So the scale of this, uh, of this molecule is going to be smaller than the scale of the previous molecule. The previous molecule, uh, the scale is set at 300 base pairs. The scale of this molecule is set at 150 base pairs. Uh, is the best mo so to this you add, so in order to have these penalties, what you need to do is to add some energies and some bending energy and some torsional energy. In that way, you can account for supercoiling as well. And, and that has been very popular. It's, it's a very popular model. So it's a best model for representing DNA in solution, as we know, naked DNA in solution. Uh, the, at the moment, there are no analytical, no analytical results for this model, although you can think that maybe through calculus of variation, we could get some, some results. And uh, some of the algorithms that are used here uh, are also common to the previous model that I'll, I'll show. Yes. It's a polygonal curve, and again, as, as before, you will, have to, you will have to put some extra volume at the end. If you were to do, I'm going to discuss mainly Monte Carlo. Uh, if you were to do molecular dynamics, through molecular dynamics, you put an energy and you're solving Newton's equations with this given energy. So you take volume exclusion as you go. In Monte Carlo methods, you have to generate the samples and then impose this condition of volume exclusion, meaning that two segments cannot be closer to each other. And then that's, those are the confirmations you are going to, ki to keep, the co those that are far apart. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Okay, so uh, what, I, what I just mentioned, we are going to, uh, there are different ways that you can work with these models, mainly uh, molecular dynamics and Monte Carlo methods, and I'm going to explain Monte Carlo methods, which is a way to generate a sample of these molecules and then ask what's the, how many of those are noted, what's the crossing number of these molecules, and so on. So this is one algorithm that is uh, very common. It's called uh, the equilateral random polygon, a crankshaft. And the idea is the following. So you generate a molecule, as is shown in here. You pick two points at random. These two points define a vertex, uh, an, an edge. This edge divides the polygon in two subwalks. And then you select one of those walks at random and rotate it around this uh, this edge, all right? And then you, you do that one time, then you select another two points, that defines another edge, and then you can rotate, and so on and so forth, all right? So that generates uh, a Markov chain. This Markov chain is irreducible, meaning that you can visit every type of knot uh, using this model. And um, th that was shown by, by Ken Millet. And it's, it's fairly fast, although the time growth within a square is, is, is reasonably, uh, reasonably good. Uh, the, um, oh, let me, let me continue. So once you do this, what you are going to do, you, you start with a molecule that you generate, doesn't matter how you generate. You are going to apply crankshaft move for uh, several, thousand, several thousand times, then you take a sample. Then you apply it again, you take another sample, apply it again, take another sample, and so on. So there are a number of things we have to worry about that, and I'll go, I'll go in detail uh, in a couple of slides on how we address those, those different uh, steps. Um, once you have these molecules that you have sample, then, for instance, what you can do is compute the knot type. Because you are going to have hundreds of thousands of molecules Doing something like the Hohenflei polynomial is very expensive. So what we usually do is compute the Alexander polynomial, but not even the Alexander polynomial. We take the Alexander polynomial, evaluate it at one point, all right? And that's what we were discussing just today in knot plot. If you do the Alex minus one command, basically it's doing this process, correct? So you have a knot, you're going to have a polygonal trajectory, 
you compute the Alexander polynomial and then you evaluate it at a negative one. And that will give you whether or not, well, it's not or not, or that's, that's at least how you decide. All right, so let me give you then kind of what would be the steps that I was uh, mentioning earlier. So you generate a closed curve, you apply crankshaft m times, and the reason why you apply crankshaft m times is so that you forget about this initial conformation. This initial conformation that you generate could be completely biased, and it could be not part of the distribution that you are going to try to sample. Then you select the first node, compute the node type, the crossing number, any kind of topological properties you want to compute. Um, then you keep in crossing, and then for any other node, apply crankshaft. Uh, Hedgehog is another type of algorithm similar to crankshaft. Then compute the uh, perform the same uh, study, and then at the end you will have to know whether you have converged, your algorithm ha has converged. So you look at the one way to visualize this, in the x-axis you can put the number of iterations, the number of samples you have. In the y-axis you put whatever property that you, you are trying to measure. And as you increase the number of samples, you should see this graph kind of converge into something. And that would be, that's an empirical way to know whether your algorithm has converged or not. And uh, usually you have to play also a little bit with M and N, just M to make sure that your samples are not biased by your original conformation and N um, for, for the number of crankshaft moves. Now, the, the reason why you cannot do one crankshaft move and then take a sample, another crankshaft move, take a sample, another crankshaft move, take a sample, and you need to do several crankshaft moves in between samples is because you have correlation in this time series. All right, so if you have something that is knotted and you do just one crankshaft move, the probability that the next conformation is noted as well is going to be very high. So what you need to do is take several uh, crankshaft moves and then hopefully this guy will have forgotten about this, uh, this initial conformation. So this is one example. So for instance, uh, for the knotting probability, this is for another algorithm that we propose, but uh, the crankshaft is, is okay. So we generate 10 to the 5 polygons, compute the Alexander polynomial, and then divide, this would be one extra zero here, uh, compute the knotting probability as the number of knotted polygons that you observe divided by, by 100,000. Um, then you can converge uh, convergence and correlation. So this is what you would do in the case though of if you want to measure the knotting probability. And if you want to measure the complexity of the knot, now, Measuring the complexity of the knot can be complicated, can be difficult, because you could try to uh, know the knot type, but that's going to be very hard very soon. So what you can do is compute number of crossings. Now, we know that knots are classified by the minimum number of crossings, but that wouldn't be quite what we want because it wouldn't represent the molecule that we have in front of us. What we want to do is take a molecule and compute the num or take a projection and compute the number of crosses in this projection and then take another projection and do the same thing and another and another and another. So you take multiple, uh, multiple projections and then you compute the average over all those molecules that you are analyzing. That's why we say the mean, well it, it comes later, is the mean average of the number of crossings. Right? The reason why you want to take several projections is because if you have two segments like this, and I look from here, I don't see any projection. So this projection wouldn't have any crossings. But if I move from here, if I look at it from here, definitely I see that, right? So that's, uh, that's how we, we are going to take, measure the, oh, the complexity of these knots. Or for this, I think we did between three and 500. 500, and that, that should be enough. The Gauss integral. Yeah, we've, we've done both actually. And, and uh, the Gauss integral is actually a little bit faster. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I didn't want to get into it. <laughs> All right. So, uh, this, for this model, for the, for the uh, equilateral random polygon, the, uh, com the computer simulations come together with some theoretical results. Uh, these two theorems uh, are from Jan and Diao. The first one tells you 
that the knotting probability is going to increase exponentially fast with the, with the length of the molecule. And that would be, uh, uh, that's kind of the first, the first theorem. And it's key the fact that it's exponentially fast. And then the second one, it tells us how the complexity of the knot is going to grow, measured by the average crossing number. And that complexity grows as n log n. So if you combine these two, uh, these two results, basically together with the simulations, so this is telling you or is explaining why biologists see what they see, right? You take molecules and uh, we didn't show, we didn't show the, this, this part, but you know that this theorem is telling you that you are going to see knots with relatively high probability, especially the knots if the length, uh, the molecules are large, and you, it's going to tell you how the complexity of the knot is going to grow, all right? So the, what we saw that you have uh, mostly trefoils is basically responsible, this is responsible for that, and the fact that you have knots is, uh, is explained by this theorem, all right? Are there any questions? Okay, so now we go to another example, which is uh, uh, molecules extracted from, from viruses, especially bacteriophages. So I'm going to speed up. You already know a little bit kind of, it's the same, it's similar argument, but let me tell you this. So two groups uh, in, in the 80s observed that when they extract DNA from bacteriophages, from these viruses, then they saw knots. And they were interested in these knots, not because of the, uh, of the viruses themselves, but because they were trying to understand the role of these enzymes, topoisomerases. Now, the experiment they did, they took this virus, they produced a mutant virus that has only the head, and uh, they, they uh, phenol treat this uh, structure, and then they saw knots. So, yes. Well, viruses are, <laughs> it's, a, it's an argument whether they are alive or not. But uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's the first time that they were found in something. Yeah, correct, correct. Um, so let me explain you a little bit more on why so these experiments make sense. So this is a virus, uh, a, ba a bacteriophage. They have this capsid. The DNA is going to be packed in here. Then you have this, uh, this structure called the connector and, and the packing motor here. And then you have the tail and the tail fibers. The tail fibers are used to recognize the cell that is going to infect. And uh, basically the, the DNA will be uh, expelled from here through this, uh, through this tail. Now they are called bacteriophages because this is what they do to bacteria. What you have in here, this is a very old image that they put some color recently. Uh, this is the bacterium of the bacterium cell. And these are the bacteriophages. The bacteriophages will land on the bacterium and then will inject the DNA inside. The DNA, this particular DNA, has sticky ends and they will make a circle. The circle starts d producing its genes and replicating and it makes more viruses inside. And eventually these viruses, by the amount of viruses and by some chemicals that they release, they break the walls of the bacterium and then they escape to infect other bacteria. So this is how viruses usually spread, even in ourselves, right? So uh, there is not only mathematical interest, but also social interest. So these are two bacteria, and you can read what it says. It's, hey, kid, want to be a superbug? Probably you've seen these guys in the news. So stick this in your genome. Even penicillin won't harm you. All right, so this is uh, what is happening. Probably you guys have heard about superbugs. These are bacteria that are resistant to any type of uh, drugs that we have at the moment. Uh, they are usually lethal. And the idea is that they can, they can uh, share DNA. They can uh, uh, transfer DNA from one bacterium to another. So if this one happens to be resistant to certain drug and shares that piece of DNA with this other one, then this one becomes also resistant to the drug and that's kind of the medical crisis we're finding. So because bacteriophages do what they do, then there is a trend, or it's been actually for many years, people thinking, well, we, can, we should use bacteriophages as a drug to treat bacteria. 
okay? Because they are going to, they don't do anything to you and they should be able to kill this bacteria. So there is a, a line of research um, working uh, along these lines. All right, so this is how bacteriophages are formed. So you f first, the, uh, there is a process of self-assembly of proteins as is shown in here. These are called the scaffolding proteins. These are called the capsid proteins. Then the DNA gets in. The scaffolding proteins are kicked out and the, um, the capsid proteins mature. So the way they mature is represented here by triangles pointed out, pointing in. And then the DNA is packed through this motor and eventually it uh, is packed in there. Now, this is kind of uh, an illustration, but it's far from whatever is happening in reality. In reality, the DNA concentration, well, this is a picture. This is the bacteriophage, this is the tail, and this is all the DNA that has to fit in there, right? So uh, the DNA concentration is between 200 and 800 milligrams per mil. That's a lot. That translates into a pressure of 50 atmospheres. Now, where are the forces here? On one hand, you have repulsion of DNA fibers. On the other hand, you have the entropy that you lose when you pack the DNA, and you also have the bending rigidity that has to be overcome to put the DNA in here. So you have competitions between bending of the DNA and repulsion, and the DNA, when the virus is going to infect, for instance, uh, it comes up at a five or greater than 50,000 base pairs per second when the DNA is, uh, uh, is injected in the, in the virus. So you can think that even though we play a lot with these models and we pretend that we understand how this is, the physical conditions are really far away from that, correct? And that happens across biology, I would say. It's, it's common to all biological systems. You come up with some toy model, you think it's like that, but biology is going to be always more complicated. All right, so this is, uh, these are experiments we did a number of years ago where we take this DNA from the viruses. And what we saw is that uh, the we, instead of having these nice bands that we've served, we have this smear. And uh, as in these particular viruses, as I mentioned, they also have a sticky ends. So what you would expect is that once you extract the DNA from the virus, you heat it up, you break those double strand breaks, the molecules become uh, linear in solution. If you freeze that and put it on the gel, this is what you get. So all these, vi all these knots disappear and are got stuck over here. All right, so that's a way you undo those knots. Because again, you have these sticky ends with heat, they open up. Uh, we saw in this case, the, the mutants, which are the, the, the ones we're interested in, they produce 95% of virus, of, of nuts. Remember that the one, basically the same molecule in free solution produce 3% of trefoils, and this one produce 95% uh, of molecules, and most molecules will be very complicated. So this is only the analysis that we did for, li for the low crossing numbers. But basically most of the molecules are uh, 15, 20 crossings and above. So someone was asking why to study nodes that are more complicated than 15. Well, this virus is produced 30 or more. So, so that's a good, there's a, at least a biological motivation to study them. So then what we propose is that given this difference, and apparently there is nothing else going on, then we say that nodes uh, that are forming these viruses uh, are due most likely to confinement. So if you are to condense DNA, then the knot improbability should go up. How can we test that hypothesis? Well, we did what we were just uh, talking about, where you, we generate equilateral random polygons confined to spheres, right? So you are going to apply the same algorithm that I, I was mentioning earlier, but now anything that is outside the sphere, you are going to toss it out. Of course, there are tricks to improve the, the convergence of those methods called Metropolis Monte Carlo methods, but in essence is that. So just pick up the ones that are inside the sphere. So let's see what happens. So if this is, uh, if this is the length in terms of, uh, of units, uh, of unit length uh, segments, and this is the not in probability, these are spheres of different radii, what is gonna happen? First, if I fix a radius, when, when the molecule grows in length, then the knot improbability is going to grow up. And if I fix the length and I look at different radii, then also the knot improbability is going to grow. The, we did an estimate in 2002, and then the group of Micheletti, they used multiple Markov chains, which is another technique similar to what I proposed, but more efficient. 
and they came up with this uh, explanation. Now, something interesting is that there is no theorem for this, and I'll uh, I'll tell you I'll, I'll I'll write it later as a conjecture. So we don't know how to prove the methods that are used to prove the theorems that I mentioned earlier don't work when you when you try to prove here. Now we did also we look at the average crossing number and we know before I told you that the gr average crossing number grows as n log n in this case grows as n square and this is basically the same graph well, here we have the length and the average crossing number and then we see that it's going to grow like this for this case we have both the simulations and a theorem so what is lacking in this in this whole work is a theorem for this for this process all right, so we published this a number of years ago, and we said that computer simulations uh, reveal that curves in confined volumes have high probability of being noted, and the knots that we have, that we observe, are very complex. Therefore, we suggest that this theory can be applied to analyze the data that we have, and the confinement plays a key role in uh, noting of, 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 this, of these viruses. Now, someone from San Diego actually did, it appeared all over these places. And what they did was to, talking about physical knots, they took ropes uh, of different types and then basically they put them in a dishwasher without water and then look at the knotting probability. And kind of the way they sold it is like, well, this is why the Christmas lights are all knotted up. This is why your headphones are knotted up. This is why everything is knotted up in your life, correct? And it was catch up by the by the news, and it was was fun. So anyway, so as a homework, anybody interested in proving this theorem, it's more than welcome. If you fix if you fix the radius, then and you increase the length of the molecule, then the knotting probability is going to go up, and it's going to grow exponentially fast. So the simulation is telling us even the coefficients. And if you fix the r if you increase you fix the length and you increase the radius, what is going to happen is that when the radius is too small, you cannot fit the molecule, so it's going to be zero. As the radius increases, it will reach a maximum, and then when the radius is too large, the molecule won't see, won't feel the effects of confinement. So then it will reach some sum of plateau. Okay, and that's uh, that's what we know. Now uh, we have like I think we I started five ten minutes later, so I think we have enough time. Well, the second part of the talk is about these organisms. These are very nasty organisms. I'm going to explain to you in a minute how, how they are and how they work. And these are called uh, trypanosomes. And this is a picture of, we didn't take this picture, but it's, um, this is a picture of this organism. All right, so what are these trypanosomes? Uh, trypanosomes are responsible for, in, for two very uh, important diseases. In Africa, it's called African trypanosomiasis are also called a sleeping sickness, and in the, in, uh, in the Americas it's called Chagas disease. Maybe some of you have heard of these diseases. Uh, the, the African version is transmitted by a fly called the tsetse fly, and uh, what uh, is uh, this, so that the tsetse fly will have the, um, the, the, the trypanosome, the, the parasite, in its saliva, and then when it bites you, the trypanosome goes in with the saliva, gets in your body, and then gets the, you get the disease uh, because the organism will start reproducing. So somehow these organisms have two life cycles, one within the insect and one within the human. Um, American trypanosomiasis is similar, but it's transmitted by another bug that is called the kissing bug. And it's called the kissing bug because it bites you near your mouth. And when the, when the, uh, the virus, in this case, it has, it has the trypanosome in its gut. And when it defecates, it goes into your blood as well. And that's how you get Chagas. Now, Chagas is not as lethal or as aggressive as the, tri as the, uh, as the sleeping sickness. It takes, uh, but it takes a lot longer. And it's hardly, many times it's not detected because people start developing symptoms 20 years after or 30 years after. So by the time you realize it's too late and basically your heart is all full of holes correct so so it's they're nasty <laughs> all right so what can we why are we interested in this organisms? yes so it basically perforates your heart it kind of uh, it's on the on the on the fibers um all right so this is kind of a, a schematic of the organism why are we interested why are not theories interested in this <coughs> let me show you 
So this is the organism. It has a flagellum that might kind of allows it to move. This thing over here is called the mitochondrium. This is where the uh, energy of the cell is being produced. The mitochondrium has DNA as well, and it's all compacted in this little region. If you extract this DNA from here, then uh, from, the, from the cell, then what you see is this, this type of network. So biologists study this network, and what they found is that each of, well, this network is composed of circles, mini circles of DNA, uh, or partly composed of that. These mini circles of DNA, they are linked, a half link, and now if you have a network, what do you need to do? If you have a network, a topological network, what you need to do is first understand the link of any two mini circles, and second, understand how many mini circles are linked to any, any mini circle. So what they show is that the link that they have is a half link, and then they look at the network that they produce, uh, or that they, the number of neighbors that every mini circle will have, and they propose that they have three mini circles. Now, we are reproducing these experiments, and let me show you some of the results and how they would look, and kind of addresses the question that you were asking earlier. What you do is you take the networks. If you put the networks, these networks have about 5,000 mini circles or linked up, right? So it's like a chain mail. And uh, if you uh, put it in a gel, it, it will get a stuck up here. But then you can start treating it, start breaking the network into pieces. And then what is going to happen is that single mini circles will migrate down here. Then you have links that will migrate here. We have three. We believe that these ones are the ones that contain three. And four. I don't, we, are not for we don't know for sure if this is this type or not. Uh, we, we are looking into that now. But the idea in that network that I showed earlier is that by looking at the distribution of these populations, you can infer what the structure of the network was. Right? So they did it kind of by hand and uh, kind of was a beautiful work. And what, we've, what we are doing is extending this using computer simulations in a very uh, similar way. So one of the questions that you might ask is, well, why do we have a network? And the hypothesis based on what I mentioned earlier is that because you are in confinement, correct? If you are in confinement, your topology is going to go up. So if you have a bunch of mini circles in confinement, then they should be linked with higher probability. So with that uh, hypothesis in mind, we built this model based on, on, ther on uh, experimental data. So we know that they, are they form like a, a sheet. And um, the, the centers of the mini circles tend to are, th are believed to be aligned on this plane, and then the orientation could be whatever. And so we propose this. Uh, we can talk about the density of mini circles basically by either increasing the radius of the mini circles or by decreasing the, the distance between the centers. And in this particular case, we, uh, we orient them randomly. <coughs> And now what we did is, imagine that you generate one of these uh, grids with mini circles where they are linked. Now substitute the grid, the every mini circle by a point, and every linkage in between two mini circles by an edge. Then you have a graph on a lattice. And then you can ask, if you are working on, on, on random graphs, you can ask when we have a, uh, when I'm going to have a path that connects two ends of this lattice, all right, of this domain. And this is what is called percolation. So we are looking for uh, a phenomenon that basically tells you you have a bunch of mini circles, they link to each other at a given density. If I start increasing this density, then the question is when am I going to achieve uh, a path that connects the two ends? And as I mentioned earlier, this is called the critical percolation density, and this is used for f to model forest fires, for instance. If you, have, if you have a fire in the forest, you want to know what's them, or, or to prevent large forest fires, you want to know how many trees you should cut so then you don't have a fire that starts here and ends here and kind of burns the whole thing, right? So you want to see whether you can have holes here that avoid this, the, the extension. So this is similar. In this case, we want to know how much we, can, we need to condense these mini circles so we can obtain a network. Because uh, this, uh, when you do this study and you look at the density on which uh, this path, long path, is going to be formed, then what we, what you need to, what this, those simulations are going to depend on the size of your, 
of your grid, correct? So a smaller grid will take less time. So what you need to do is take the limit. So the percolation is actually defined on the limit. And you see how it kind of converges to a point. And that's your estimated percolation density, right? So it has to be the way to kind of get rid of, of, the, si of, the, of the effects of the side is just by taking a large, a large limit. So this, as before, comes with a theorem that we proved uh, a few years ago now. And uh, it tells you that there is a critical percolation density and, the critical and we can estimate the, the value of the density. And here, I don't know if you can see it well from there, he here you see the dynamics. So for low density, you start making little clusters of mini circles. And then it reaches a point where the density is fairly, uh, it's, it doesn't change much, but the size of the, of the clusters grow up a lot. And this is what we call the critical percolation density. And so we know that there, is, there has to be such a percolation. And this, if we go back now to the biology, we can ask the following question. So we know this is the organism that infects us. And this organism from evolution came from these bodosaltans, and this one came from others, correct? So now bodosaltans is a free living organism. It's not a parasite. And the mitochondrial DNA of this organism has also mini circles, but these mini circles are not linked to each other. Right? So we believe our hypothesis is that these, uh, f in the process of evolving from these bodosaltans to Tibrusi, the uh, mitochondrial DNA got condensed and then the network formed. Okay? And that's something we would like to, to test, uh, but we need to be able to analyze this organism, which, uh, which we haven't done yet. So there is a group. Uh, uh, Orlandini and others have proposed that percolation is already happening here. Uh, I, I think that might be too early to conclude that. I would say that in between Bodo Saltans and T. Bruce, that percolation phenomenon happened. All right, so then we said, well, what happens if we keep, percolation will tell us that we have a large, a large component uh, in, the, in this network of mini circles. What happens if we push it further? Well, then we'll have a point where we, uh, where we, all the mini circles are going to be linked to each other. And they just form a huge network. And we believe that the density is about 1.15 in this case. And this again comes with a theorem that tells you that the probability that you have a network that contains all the mini circles is going to grow exponentially fast with the density. All right, so it's very similar to the theorem of random knotting, but in this case, you have mini circles that you are condensing and they are linked to each other. And uh, this would explain why you see a network. And something that we can say too is how is the valence of, the, of each mini circle going to grow with density? And what we see in the, the simulations is that the valence, so the number of mini circles linked to a given mini circle, is going to grow linearly with the density of mini circles. And this is exactly what you see in the organism. In the organism, initially, the number of mini circles linked to a given mini circle has been proposed to be three. As is, well, it's, this picture is not telling you much, but, uh, but uh, once, once the organism replicates, which is this picture over here, you go from three to six. So that's what we can observe in, in the organism. So, so it grows as well linearly. So we do simulations, and that's pretty much what you see. And our model or our study suggests that for any given density, we, you'll have mostly, um, th for instance, if you, take the, the, uh, if you think that the most prevalent form is the one that has a link, has three other links uh, or three other mini circles linked to this mini circle, what we should see is a distribution of values. So then something we want to do with our own experiments is to see if we can detect not only the three, but maybe four, some five, and so on and so forth. So the theory tells you that you should have a distribution. And I think, well, I, I might finish here. Uh, well, it's, it's just a couple of slides. So that t gives us qualitatively why the network can be formed. The reason is that you have confinement, similar to what we have with the bacteriophages. So when you confine DNA, then the topological complexity is going to increase. And I would say that that's going to be true for every polymer, unless the polymer has some sort of self-interactions that avoids uh, this, 
uh, these reactions. Now, something interesting is our prediction says that at a, at a density at which we connect all the mini circles, we should have a valence of uh, of three. All right, and the experimental observation tell us that we have a density of 102. So we have to go from one to 102, and the valence is three. So somehow these organisms are condensing the DNA and keeping the topology down. All right. So the question would be. How can we achieve high density and still preserve low topological complexity? So we've been working on this. We try different models, and I'm going to give you the last, uh, the last model, and I think what it seems to me the most uh, reasonable one, which is that what we can do is tilt the mini circles. I mean, we try to make the mini circles more flexible. We try to make them fatter, thinner, everything, all, all these typical properties of DNA. And in this case, we thought, well, what happens if we till the mini circles? If you till the mini circles, then the linking, the linking probability is going to decrease. And we can increase the density. So this is the, the angle restriction. And we see how we can increase uh, the density of mini circles by just tilting them. And at the same time, whoops, the valence is going to be lower is going to be very low, all right? So these are for different angles, and this is when you get about 88 degrees. So they are kind of almost vertical. So our model suggests that these organisms prevent topological complexity, there is increment topological complexity by psh, tilting the mini circles. All right, so let me finish then. Conclusion, what we are proposing is that topological complexity either in the form of nodes, catenates, and networks, increases rapidly with DNA density, either by the length of the DNA molecule or by the number of many circles. And this, uh, the priority of this formation uh, not only increases, but also the structures that we would expect are complex. So one of the hypotheses we are managing is, well, how are these, for our, as Marielle showed up in, 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 the, in the slide yesterday, we know that all genomes are highly condensed. So how are they preventing topological complexity? All right, so let me finish uh, just by uh, thanking our group and the agencies that have been funding this research. Thank you.